Sunday Adelaide here. Uh, this is another sunny day, just like my name. <laughs> but today is really a brilliant day. It uh, looks beautiful. I mean, the sun is coming now. It's May and uh, Tuesday, and the the tenth of May here in uh, in Kiev, Ukraine. You know, it's <laughs> it's like there had never been one single drop of snow here. The way it's so warm and pleasant, and the sun is coming now. It's so nice, you would not believe it, that this this is a cold area. And uh, so, so I welcome everyone today. And uh, we're going to have a very challenging week. This week, a lot of your belief systems will be challenged. I bet you that one. Uh, you'll be, <laughs> especially your philosophical view of life and your religion will be shaken up this week. I bet you that one. But it's going to be for good. It's going to be for good. It will be for good. You're, you know, a lot of things. In fact, some of the greatest things that are holding us down are some of the things that we value most. And in our cases, most of us value religion. We value God, we value God but we mistake God for religion. So because of religion, and we have become actually <laughs> bound. We are now in bondage. Yeah, thank you, everybody who is writing. Let me welcome people who are here already. Joshua, good, af good afternoon. I think that should be in uh, Indonesia or somewhere. It's afternoon there, but it's morning here. Oh, look at your day. You are ever constant like a day. Good morning. How are you doing today? Uh, Oluwatoyi, been waiting for you, my coach, from Cyprus. <laughs> a faithful mentee, a faithful disciple. He's been waiting for me. Amazing. Thank you for that. Mashu Esson. Good morning, my brother. My si is he a sister? Okay. <laughs> good morning, Bolaji. Anton Polos, how are you today? Melissa, good morning. Yoshua, I mentioned you. Bukola, morning. Oluwatoyi. <laughs> thank you. He's been waiting for me. Nina Gresu Greshana, thank you. Obataiwo, good mornings. Susan, morning. Bolaji, good morning. Uh, yes, Oyewo, good morning. Uh, Twinkle, look, <laughs> from Australia. Good morning, Australia. Well, Australia, I'm sure it's evening or afternoon in Australia now. Mall Christian Church, Irene. Oh, this is Irene. How are you from Manchester? Marie. Therese, good morning. Adewale Emmanuel, morning. Uh, Ayodeji Solomon, morning. 7.32 a.m. in the U.K. Okay, that's just before you go to work, I guess. Samuel, good morning today. Apostle Ezra, good morning. Tola, morning to you. Iyabode, morning. Akinjo Lire, good morning. You are not writing where you are washing from this time, though. Tokumbo, good morning. Tyrin from Sri Lanka, good morning. Ebenezer, morning. Olushola, good morning. <laughs> He's been waiting for me as well. Okweyemi, good morning. Aboyowat Ikomi, morning from Wari. Wow. Of course, Adebayo from Ireland. <laughs> he has to be here before he goes to work. Geamfi, <laughs> good morning. Pope Wola, good morning. OKT James, good morning. John Austin, Dubai, wow. Blessings to you, my brother. Boa from Ghana, amazing. Faith, good morning. Hayodele from Qatar, wow. Blessings to you. Emmanuel from Tanzania, good morning. Princess Sonia from the US, blessings to you. Wow, Guanfi is from Ghana as well. Titi, Titi Sihite. From Indonesia, Jakarta, blessings to you. Felicia from New Caledonia, South Pacific. Wow, that is amazing. Hopong from Copenhagen, blessings to you. Prince Clement from Malaysia. Ho, ho. Ezeja Afamufuna from Abba, bless you. Pete, he didn't say where he's coming from. La Philippines, Lenoy, blessings. Paris. That is Gnali from Paris. Oyewo from Lagos. 
Kingsley from Jos, Nigeria. Wow. Ernest from Ghana. <laughs> oh, but Timothy, of course, he says, a weekend with, your, with you from Doha, Qatar. Disciples will forever remain in our memories. Thank you. Ade Kunle, good morning, Pastor Sunday from Northampton, UK. You are blessed, sir. You too, my brother. Kerry Nicholas from New York. Wow. Teresa from from where? From uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Osas, good morning. Andre Tarasuk, of course, California, U.S. Shegun from Ohio. Melissa, Pastor, will you pray for me? I've been under attack. We will destroy and rebuke that attack right now and set you free in Jesus' name. Max from Orlando. Uh, <laughs> of course, Louisa from South, South Korea. Afuye from Ikorodu, Lagos. Wow, that's Kayode. Uh, Koch Koam, I mean, not Koch, Koam from North Cyprus. Kali from the Philippines. Uh, Ogwa from Germany. Wow, wow, wow. Now I think I better go to the world now. Marcel from Japan. Okay, let, I think I have done enough. Let me begin to do the, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you listened to yesterday's message. And in the evening also, we had a wonderful time with Joshua. I don't know if all of you saw that one as well. But Joshua has been living with me for almost two years now. And somebody says he's a clone on Pastor Sunday. Well, the same thing with anybody from this church. People who have been listening to me, who have really been truthful in pursuing the things and, and uh, learning the things that I share with them. Uh, the same thing with uh, all the people that I've been having the review with every evening. But this week... I'm challenging you. You have to get ready. Get ready to challenge your, your understanding of God and your understanding of religion. And, you know, I think some of the things I'm going to be saying today and tomorrow and all this week might challenge your whole understanding and whole concept of the Christian faith because Christianity is not religion. But unfortunately, the way we have been practicing Christianity these days and the way most people view Christianity is like it's a religion. And even we that are born again, that are, are so passionate about our faith, we don't even realize the, the thin line between faith in God, within knowing God, walking with God, and uh, just practicing religion. So uh, yesterday, I started a series. It's a new series. Last week, the series was on love, how to love God. But that was the easy part. Now, so, although it's not going to be easy to practice, I know. I know it's not going to be easy to practice, but uh, at least thank God that you have that old revelation already about love, how to love God. But this week, I'm going to tot move to another totally different uh, area of, uh, of knowledge and of revelation. I'm going to be talking about the greatest secret of life. Of course, apart from salvation, I'm talking about practical life, day-to-day -day life. What is the greatest secret in life? The greatest secret in life that I've discovered is that life is predictable. So yesterday I spoke about that, that life is predictable. The, predictab the predictability of life is something that people, not too many people talk about. People never, spoke, people never spoke to me about it when I was growing up in my village. I thought that my life depended on the conditions of my birth. I thought that uh, if I was born in a rich family, then I have a good life. <laughs> if my parents and family are well to do, then I'm in for it. It's good for me. I thought that, uh, you know, that if you have good education or you have people to help you, then, uh, you know, you are good. But if you are born in a poor family, if you don't have good education, if you are from a village, if you are not from a Western country, if you are not from Europe, and if you are not, you know, you know so exposed and you are not given all the privileges of life, that you are doomed. And uh, I never knew that life was predictable. I didn't know that really that you know there are some life is predictable for a very simple reason that life is based upon fixed laws and principles life is based upon truth you know ordinances that God has set in place both for the good and for the bad both for Christians and non-Christians the principles work for everybody and it doesn't matter where you come from from a good family or good family or wealthy family poor family or from a poor country or rich country, my life on your life does not depend on the conditions of your birth. But I didn't know about that at all. I thought it was the opposite. 
So many people are still thinking like I used to think. So I share my story with all of you yesterday. And if you did not watch that, sto uh, that uh, program of yesterday, I want you to go back to it. Uh, you just go to my Facebook page. And uh, when you go to the Facebook page, uh, you know, go to the uh, video section. And then you could get the message there. Or you could go to my YouTube page, Sunday Adelaide Official, and you will see some of those messages there. But today I'm going to be talking, uh, continue this topic about the greatest secret of life, that life is predictable. Yesterday was life is predictable. Today I'm going to be talking more about the fact that life is predictable. Why is life predictable? Life is predictable, and God makes life predictable because he has revealed to us the principle upon which life is supposed to be operated, upon which life is supposed to function. Life is supposed to function not in some mystery, like a secret society, God and some few people like uh, Bill Gates or uh, <laughs> Warren Buffett and some wealthy individuals are deciding how life should be managed and only some secret people and secret society know how to make life work and they are the lucky ones and only few people know the secrets only some men of god should know the secret of our life should also be run and so no 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 god is not that wicked god is not keeping all the secret of life in in his own pocket and hiding it from you so that you will suffer the more no, don't look at God as, as so mean like that. My God is not mean. My God is not wicked. My God is so generous. He is so passionate about helping us. He loves us so much that he wants to give us everything that we need to help us to, to handle life better, to be able to manage life better. He wants to give us as much as we need so that we, you know, he has given us life. But he has also given us everything that we need to have life and life in abundance. And the greatest thing he has given us is not the, you know, it's not the you know, miracle working power to do experience healing and miracles and things. Those are good, but that is not the thing that we need for everyday life. So what is the greatest thing that God has given us? And it is that great thing that he has given us that has made life predictable. The greatest thing that God has given us to make our life easier and to be able to cope with the challenges of life is the fact that he made the earth to function according to fixed laws, fixed principles, fixed truth, and fixed ordinances. The whole earth, just like the, 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 uh, the law of, uh, the law of uh, you, know, you know, seasons. You see, in some countries you have uh, dry season and wet season. In some a parts of the world you have winter, uh, summer, and all that. But and also the law of gravity. Just like we have the law of gravity, that if you jump from a high, from a, 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 a high, uh, from some height that is far away, you will break your leg. You will break yourself. You will kill yourself. That's a law right there. So these are laws that are fixed, put in place to protect us, and so that our lives won't be easier. So also, not just the physical laws are put in place. Laws of life. Invisible laws, truth, ordinances are put in place that we will discover them. And so that when we discover these laws, and they have been revealed, but they are not revealed in your room in your, or in your pocket. They are revealed in the mind of people. And God has moved upon men and women of God, or your different men and women in history, to put down these laws, these principles, and this truth. And the greatest source of this truth, and the greatest source of no, 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 life, predictability of life is the word of God, the Bible. So God intentionally gave us, first of all, the Ten Commandments. Then he gave us the history of Abraham. He gave us the history of all the men of God in the Bible. And he gave us the history of Jesus, the history of the prophets, the, 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 you know, and, and all the great men. And he put them in one place, in one, uh, in one book, which we call the Bible. But we should also know that the Bible is called also the book of law. That's why it says this book of the law will not depart from your mouth. That doesn't mean you have to be confessing it and professing it. No, it means that you have to live the lifestyle that is the, you know, that, is, that, are, that are written in this, in this book of law. So what does that mean, book of law? It means book of principles. So what I want to 
talk to us today about is the fact that if you really want to discover why is life predictable, what makes life predictable are principles. You must look, begin to look at the Bible not as a religious book. I mentioned that a little bit yesterday. You must begin to look at the Bible as a book of truth, as a book of principles, as a book of instructions. So, for, But today I'm going to teach you how to do that. So that you don't read the Bible and be thinking of religion. I am so sorry and it's so sad that we have turned the Bible and God into religion. And some of the way we do it is the way we preach the Bible. For example, when I used to grow up as a child back at home, I used to hear people teach about, uh, you know, about the miracles of Jesus. For example, let's talk about the, uh, the how Jesus, let me take the popular, popular, uh, popular Bible stories. And I will now tell you how people preach it and how it's supposed to be preached in the real sense. Beyond that, what has made it into religion and what is, and what is supposed to be. We are supposed to preach the Bible in such a way that it is not perceived just as religion, but it, is now, it must now be perceived as a book of truth and as a book of instruction, as a book of principles. So what does that mean? Let's take, for example, the story of uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000. In some cases, 4,000. In some cases, 5,000. So how can I, the way people preach this, and it makes, look, it makes it look like a religion, is that when you go to church, people begin to preach to you, Yo, can you see Jesus? He, he's such a mighty God. Everything is possible for God. God did, you know, did this miracle, and he fed 5,000 people. Oh, so, but the whole emphasis is that you see, God fed 5,000 people. He's such a great God. He's our God. Our God is uh, a mighty God. Everything is possible for him. But when I hear those kind of messages, I think, but if he's God, what, what else do you expect from God? God is almighty. If he's almighty God, feeding 5,000 shouldn't be any big deal for him. And if he's Jesus, the son of God, the second of the Trinity, why are you trying to convince me? It's like the pastors are trying to convince us to believe God. I believe him already. That's why I'm here. Those kind of preachings are not meant for church preachings. Those kind of preachings to make people believe that God is almighty, that God can feed the, 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 the 200 people or 1,000 people or 5,000 people, that, that you should believe in him, that it's nothing impossible for him. Those kind of preachings are good, but they are only good for evangelism. They are only good for crusades. They are only good for where you are trying to win people to God to make them believe in God. But when you are already a believer, when you, that's why Jesus preached differently when Jesus was tra you know, traveling and going from village to village. He talks about that in Matthew, in all the Gospels, that he would go from village to village. And that's where he meets with people who don't know him and who don't know God really well yet. And he does miracle and he performs it to show to them the mightiness of God and that they should believe in God. That is okay. But when, it comes to the, when Jesus comes to, 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 uh, to synagogues, he begins to read the word and begins to preach the word in a totally different way. He preaches the word in a different way to believers than he, preaches, he preached it to unbelievers. He preached in a different way to people outside of the synagogue, and he preached in a different way to people in the synagogue. And that's, what the, the, what, that's a little bit of difference that preachers today don't pay attention to. And what, what, how, we, how is this message supposed to be preached about Jesus feeding the, for the 5,000? When we come, we are already talking to church members or believers, we should be telling them, you see what Jesus did here? Jesus fell, fed 5,000 people. We should be looking for the, we should be asking ourselves, every time you read the Bible, you should always ask yourself a question. What is the truth that God wants me to gain from this? Or better said, what is the principle that God is trying to underline in this story to me? Any scripture you read, not just New Testament, but Old Testament also, there is a, always a principle that is underlining every story. In every story in the Bible, in every event, in every occurrence of the Bible, whatever passage you read in the Bible, God wants to show you some principles. And normally there are two principles. Number one principle is, what does, the question you should ask yourself, what principle does this passage teach me about God? That's number one. Number two question you should ask yourself, what 
principle does it teach me about myself? Because once you discover the principle that this passage is teaching you about God, then you know who God is better. So, and when you know God, who God is, then you discover yourself because you are made in his image. And also, when you know who God is, when you ask yourself, what is the principle this teaches me about God? It's easier then for you to answer the question. So what does he teach me about myself? So let's take this story, for example, of, of uh, feeding 5,000 people. What it, that story teaches us is that God is compassionate. God cares for the needs of people. Rem what does, what, the thing about principle is this. is a rule, a truth of how life is supposed to be lived. So once you understand that, okay, the reason why Jesus is doing all these miracles and feeding the poor and doing all these things is that he's revealing the nature of God to us. He's telling us who God is. God is a compassionate God. So what does that tell me about myself? That tells me that I cannot be any other thing less if my God, whose image I carry, he is compassionate and he will not pass by the need of the hungry. If he will feed the needy, it's not about the fact that he can do miracles. He is, oh, look at how great he is. He can do miracles. That's why he's God. He can, of course he can do miracles. I mean, you, you, that's, I know he can do miracles, but what does that do to me today? If he's not going to do the miracles right now, I mean, what does that, how does that change me? He's supposed to teach me to know him better. And the way I know him better is to know some features about him, some characteristics about him, and the character and the principle, the truth about God that God is showing me in that passage when he fed the 5,000 is that, okay, my God is so compassionate that he will not pass by the needy. Even if they are hungry or they are sick, he is so caring. And if he's so caring, if he's so compassionate, I discover myself right there. I now know who I am supposed to be. I am supposed to be in his image. I'm supposed to be like him. And to be like him, it means anything I do, this must now become a building block in my life. A building block of a principle that I bring to my life to build my life up. It's become a building block upon which I take my decisions. I look at life. I begin to look at life through that lenses. Through those lenses. I begin to look at life through that mirror. That okay, now I got it. I must be like him. I must be compassionate like him. If he will not pass by the needy. If he will do miracle even to feed them. I must also be always looking for ways that I might use to feed other people or to meet the needs of people. So that is what it shows me about God. And that's what it shows me about myself. Listen closely again. Every time you read the Bible, the purpose of you reading the Bible is to change. It's for you to change from who you are right now to, to, uh, to, to become like he is. And for you to become like God is, you must see, first of all, how he is. And once, uh, the only way to discover how he is, is that any time you read the Bible, any time you read any story there, ask yourself that question. What is the principle here that God wants to point out to me about himself? What does he want to teach me here about himself? Once I see who he is, then it's easy for me to say, aha, uh -huh. That is how I am supposed to be. Then you bring that, that as a building block in your life. It becomes a life principle that makes life predictable to you. And you know that, okay, if God is so kind, if God is so compassionate, and you make yourself, you work on yourself to change, and to make yourself compassionate, to make yourself to be so kind, and to make yourself somebody that never passes by the needs of others, once you become like that, then you can read other scriptures. What are the promises? What are the things that happen to people who never pass by the need of others? The, that the Bible says, those such people, God will never pass them by. Such people, God will remember them in the time of need. So the, that's what makes your life predictable. Your life has become predictable because you have changed. You have become like God in that sense. You don't pass by the need of any other, anybody. You meet their needs. You are kind to them. You are compassionate. You behave like God. So in that sense, you know what will happen to you when you encounter a need. You know the destiny of your children. That means in that sense, life has become predictable to you. 
Let's look at another story that we all know very well. Let's look at the story of Abraham. Abraham was called to leave his own fatherland. And we all know that story. I will not go into that. And you had a long journey of all kind of occurrences and things happening to him. What does that teach me as a believer? As a believer, my friend, when we read that scripture, I mean, what, what I see in church, and that makes the church religions, because when you teach about the feeding of the 5,000, and you begin to talk about God, what God can do, everybody just makes his religion. Because, oh, okay, God is... And you keep on hearing that all your life. Since I was a child, since you were in the kindergarten, you know God fed 5,000 people. But what do I do with that? Nobody tells us that. Just believe in God. I already believe. Oh, okay, well, you... So we begin to use God to get what we need because they are teaching it as if God is almighty. God can do everything. So, you know, you just believe him. So we become religious, going to church, not to please God, not to change to his image, not to become like him, but to use him to get our needs met. So instead of us to work hard like Jesus worked hard, like God himself worked hard, we begin to just wait and wait on God to do something for us. So, you know, we, that is religion. That's what religion does. Religion in, incapacitates you. Religion makes you to, to not be careful of what you could do, to not discover yourself, but it makes you to rather look unto God as if you are paralyzed, as if only God can do anything, but as if you cannot do anything. That's what religion does to people. But when you look at it from the concept of a principle, that the Bible, the word of God is a principle, it's a truth that is revealed to you for you to discover who God is and who you are and for you to be changed to his image, then you are reading the Bible with enthusiasm, with, with, with desire to change, with the desire to become like him. So every day something new is changing in your life. You are bringing a new principle. So let's go back to the story of Abraham. If we are just reading it, I mean, I've heard the story of Abraham. He, he was called by God. He left his city and he left his town and I mean, country, homeland. And he went and, you know, all these things happened to him. Everybody kept on reading that story. We all know the story. It's not a big deal about the story. So the, that, that is what makes people to think that church and Christianity is boring because it's just repeating the same stories all over again. And everybody already knows the story. So all these pop stars and movie stars and Hollywood stars, they don't want to go to church anymore. They already know all the stories because they have not been taught what, how we should relate to that story. We should look at the Bible as a book of principle. So that's why we, should, we are reading it every time to gain new principles and to make that principle a part of our life. So when we read the story of Jesus being called, what does that mean to me? That tells me that life is a journey. That God, for me to start my own life, I can only start my life not when I'm living for myself. That means that at this, this stage of life when Abraham was living for himself, you know, he has not started living yet. For me to begin to live, I must obey the voice and the calling of God. I must decide to live something. So, so, so one principle is that life is a journey. That is a principle. I must set out on a journey to be able to make something of my life. Number two, what, on what basis does my journey begin? My journey must begin on the basis of the leading of God or the voice of God. That's number two principle. Okay, I must now get the leading of God. What does it want me to do? And number three principle, once I get the leading or the voice of God, what he wants me to do in life, finish. I get the understanding what he wants me to do. I must be ready to forsake something. That's what he's saying. I forsake my fathers. I must be ready to forsake my old life. I must be ready to forsake my friends, my people, things that are holding me down or things that could stop me from carrying out that mission that God has got for me. That's number three principle. Number four principle here is that on my way to fulfillment, on my way to pleasing God, on my way to becoming a father of nations, on my way to become great in life, I will encounter all kinds of challenges. That is another principle there. And I must, so that makes me ready to battle it out and not to be running away from problems. Because today, the way Christianity is being preached is that, oh, God did all this miracle for Abraham. And you see, God gave him this, God gave him that. So we are again depending on God and just waiting for God to do something for us. But really, God gave us that story so that we might be able to discover how we are supposed to live life. And we, the, the thing is that God is telling us about the challenges of Abraham, not for us to just wait until God comes to, to deliver us. No, but how to 
stand it through adversity, how to go through adversity, how to you know, overcome through faith all the problems and challenges that will come. And it's not how to escape from problems, no, how to go in faith against problems, how to confront problems, how to challenge problems, how to use our faith like Abraham to surmount, to surmount any challenge, any mountain that comes against us. That is the principle right there. And also another principle you could get from that story is the fact that God promised Abraham that he would become the father of nations. But the result was not immediate. So anything God promises me, anything that I want to, I believe that God wants me to do, and I should just be faithful in doing it and not expect an immediate answer, immediate miracle. We sometimes want instant miracle. And that is why the way the people preach the gospel without telling us the process and just saying all the miracles is you know, depriving us of our humanity. We lose who we are. We lose who God wants us to be. We don't become like the great men of faith, like the, you know, like the patriarchs of faith. We want to have a result immediately. We want an immediate result, immediate miracle. But the story actually tells us that we must be persevere. We must, we must be patient. We must, be perse- uh, we must persevere. We must, uh, be, you know, we must have long suffering for us to enter the promise. So these, those are principles right there. You know, I could talk about many other stories that we all know. Okay, let's talk about the story when, uh, you know, I'm just trying to tell you how you read the Bible and it becomes to you a religion or how you preach the Bible and you preach it and it becomes to people as a religion and it decapacitates you or and how you are supposed to look at the Bible and read the Bible as a book of principles. Once you begin to read the Bible as a book of principles and you begin to see and look for principles and truth in every episode of the Bible, you, 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 are, you become a different person. You become a, a world changer. There is history maker. You begin to manifest, you know, the results. You are no more at the mercy of where you are born. You are no more at the mercy of your background. You are no more at the mercy of money. You are no more at the mercy of people around you or the country where you live in. You are not at the mercy of anybody. I'm sorry to say this, but you are not even at the mercy of God. Why? Because God already gave you the principles. It's now, you, are just, you are now at the mercy of your own self. Talk less of Satan. Just forget about demons and demonic forces. Forget about those ones. Just forget about those ones. Those ones don't even matter. Because you have been defeated. Satan has been defeated. But you are at the mercy of yourself. Of yourself. Either you are going to take the time to discover the principles or you are going to work on yourself to live by those principles, then that is when your life becomes predictable. But when you begin to believe that your life depends on what if God will bless you or will not bless you, he has already blessed you. (laughs) Everything he created, they are already blessed. Even unbelievers who understand principles are having results. Talk less of you who is a believer. Why won't you have results? The Bible already told you that, you know, I know the plan that I have for you to give you, I mean, plan of good and not of evil to give you an expected end. So we already know that God has good plan for you. We already know that he has a plan, good of, no, a plan to give you an expected end, to give you a future. So we already, God's part is already done. He even died for you to prove that to you. So leave God alone out of this thing. You know I mean? Be, just be thanking him worshiping him discovering him be like him try to please him that is the one you are supposed to be doing with god not to be going to wait as 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 if you are uh yeah, as if you are you no know, you are paralyzed and you are you are incapacitated and be going to church to, for god to do for you something what he has already done that is what religion does for you religion kills you religion kills you immorally it kills your initiative it makes you to just do one motion all the time and you'll be thinking you can only preach or you can only achieve success in 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 in, in church or something like that or do religious stuff that's why we don't have too many christians who are at the top of their craft all over the world that's why the biggest the richest people the biggest names in the world are not christians because we are kept to say that in the church and to just be waiting for god's mercy God's mercy has been given to all mankind. He ascended to heaven and sent gifts to men. And it doesn't matter which men. Christian men, non-Christian men, either women, no women. He has already given us all the grace, all the gifts, everything we need for life, for abundant life. And to everybody, 
what we should now do is to discover what are the rules behind this life he has given us. What are the principles behind this, this, this life he has given us. And how can we discover the secrets to be like him and to do exploits and do his will on the earth. So when you read the Bible and you, and you only talk about what God did. Oh, look at how God uh, saved that woman. Oh, look at how God do this. Do this. God can do this. God is almighty. God... Yes, God. we all know that. Everybody knows that. Even Satan knows that God is almighty and he trembles. Even angels of Satan know that. But we need so, supposed to know what God did, how he did it, so that we might be able to repeat the same thing. So that we might be able to be his image and likeness. We are supposed to discover God so that we might discover ourselves and glorify his name better. So I spoke about the example of uh, feeding the, uh, feeding the, uh, the 5,000. Let me take another example from the New Testament. Let's take the example of the, um, of, of, uh, the woman that was brought to Jesus because she was a sinner and she was caught in adultery. And uh, so what story, what, what that story, what does it teach me? It teaches me that men are fallible. All of us are fallible. Why? Because Jesus said, if any one of you is there who is without sin, throw the stone. So I am fallible and other people are fallible. That is, I, I have weaknesses. Other people have weaknesses. I can fail. Other people can fail. So, because all of us are fallible, I should never judge anybody that fails right now. Because tomorrow I might fail. So that is one principle. It's not just to be t telling the story of the woman and stone and everything. People just repeat stories. But we don't point out the principles or the truth that people are supposed to bring into their lives. Number two, what is the number two principle? God is a defender of the oppressed when people fail god does not throw stones at them god stands in between them and the accusers okay so when i see people who fail i don't spread rumors about them i don't stop throw stones at them i don't condemn them i don't talk about them i stand between them and the people who want to condemn them that is the principle for me then you know uh, they said uh, the, it's written in the law that shows me another principle people will use bible people will use the law to try to, you no, know, the letters of the law, to try to kill individuals, to try to destroy human life. But God died for humans. God died for people. So I should never do that. I know, oh, Jesus stopped them from using letters to destroy man. So anybody that fail, or anybody that have weakness, even if they are terrorists, or they are Muslims, or they are something, I don't use the word of God to try to kill them. And even if they are my enemies, I don't pray for, for God to kill them. I don't pray for, for fire to come and consume them from heaven. I try to understand where they are coming from. I try to have compassion on them because Jesus had compassion. Instead of stone, you know, allowing this woman to be stoned, he had compassion upon her. God is a God of mercy. So any story we read is telling us about the nature of God and who we are supposed to be and how we are supposed to alter and change our lives to become like the life of God. Then Jesus told her, go and sin no more. So because God has shown her mercy and love, now he could instruct her to change her lifestyle. So the same thing with us, that's how we're supposed to be looking at situations. So if we really want to, you know, become, to, to make life predictable, every time you read the Bible, the Bible is the greatest book in life, in the world. What makes it the greatest book? It's not because it's written about God. There are many books that are written about God. But in the, the way the Bible is written, is written in such a way that it is the laws upon which life is ruled that is written there, it, uh, that are written there. It is the principles of life that are supposed to guide our lifestyle that makes the, the Bible unique. The Bible, the Bible tells us that Moses brought law, but Jesus brought grace and truth. So the Bible is a book of truth. And the Bible is a book of grace. So that, that is the principle he's teaching us for me to know the nature of God, who God is, and who I am supposed to be. So, I mean, it's a beautiful thing. When you begin to look at the Bible as a book of principles, then you will discover that life indeed is predictable. Life is not a mystery. Life will stop being a mystery because mystery is something that has not been unveiled. Mystery is something that has not been revealed. But the truth has been revealed in Christ Jesus. The truth and has been brought by Christ Jesus. Not just truth has been brought by Christ Jesus. Even uh, grace has been brought to be able to implement that truth. 
Jesus has already brought the truth. He has already brought deliverance. He has already brought examples, principles. And all these principles are upon which the whole earth uh, is, is, is established. And if we would discover the truth and the principles upon which the earth is established, we can make our lives predictable. We know exactly what to expect when we behave like that. Okay? Let's look at any other story. Let's look at the story, for example, of... Uh, of Jesus, of the woman with the issue of, uh, issue of blood. The woman with the issue of blood, and she, you know, we all know that story. Oh, she was so desperate. She had faith, everything, which is good. But it's also telling us something. If you want, it's, it's a principle for me. God wants to reveal something to me. If I want to achieve anything in life, I must be desperate. I know so many Christians that, you know, that are praying to God for God to do something for them. But they are not desperate. They don't behave desperately. They don't go out of their way. They don't you know, despise shame. They don't despise, you know, the woman de despised all the shame and the, uh, you know, the way they will be looking at her, the, you know, the crowd, and the, she op overcame her obstacles. But Christians don't want to despise her. We want to look nice. We are waiting for God to come down and do. But this is a lesson. This is a principle for us that, no, I don't wait for God. I go after God. I don't wait until God comes to me. No, I pursue God. That's a principle right there for us. And then, you know, and also it's a principle that whenever I desire something, there will be people who will be on my way. And what did the woman do? The woman got away through all the crowd, or through all the hindrances of people. It means the same, that's a principle for me. It means anytime people are on my way, I should find a way to jump over them or to go under them or to find my way to get my results. That is how Christians, we are not desperate. We are not you know, putting all our energy and all our you know, effort to do what we are seeing in the Bible. We only tell the stories. You see, every Christian knows the stories. But we don't know the principles behind those stories. That's our problem. That's why we are not changing. That's why we are not taking the world. And when we are just telling the stories over and over again, people become bored and becomes religion. You come tell, tell the story and people just be, as if God can do this, God will do this for Yes, we know God can do it. When you only talk about God's side and God's aspect of it, that is religion. That's like any other religion does. But when you talk about God's side and your side, and how you are supposed to imitate God, how you are supposed to become his image, it's a different story altogether. It's a different story. Then it's changing your life. Every story will be changing your life. Every story will become a building block in your life. Every story will be making you a better person. Every story will be changing you to become God's image for real. Well, I've been talking for so long. Let's, let, let me hear what you are saying. Let me hear what you are saying. Uh, okay, is that a good place? Yes, Ronke Oyetayo says, he is saying we have the mercy of God already. We have it. God has revealed the truth about his mercy, grace. We just need to discover it and thank him. He's not saying we don't need God. Yeah, I'm not saying we don't need God. You got it right. I'm saying we already have the goodness of God. We already have God with us. We don't need to be seeking him as if he's lost. He's not lost and he's not far from us. He's inside of us. We should be seeking him to be like him. We should be seeking him to please him. Not for him to go and do no, for, for us what he already done, what he already said he has done for us. Now, uh, Emmanuel says, Olushola, a passionate and insightful teacher. What a revelation. Oyewo says, really, we dwell so much around the mountain, but we need to move forward. Yes, Pastor, you are right. Tamba says, hello, Pastor. Uh, Oyewo says, but it is not always of him that run it, or will it, but of God that showeth mercy. Yes, but you already have that mercy. God already shown you mercy. Don't doubt it. Just believe him. Believe him you already have mercy. Believe him he already showed you mercy. You don't need to begin to convince him to show you mercy. As if you are more interested in your good than God is interested in your good. No, God is more interested in your good. God is more interested in you to get his mercy. You didn't think about his mercy. He, it was not your idea. His mercy was not your idea. It is God's idea. He revealed to you his mercy already. Don't stand there waiting for some mercy. Go, believe that you already have that mercy. And go to be, use that mercy to change your world. To glorify God. To please the heart of the master. Melissa says, blessings. Uh, Stan says, 
Now, this is what I call proper talk. <laughs> this is what the body of Christ means. Example of the bold leader who is not afraid to call things the way as they are. You have a great message, Pastor Sunday. Thank you. Well, Stan, if you really think so, I would like to challenge all of you right now to look down on your button of share. Go find your share button and share this message with as many people as possible. It could be a blessing to some people. How do you? I'm sure so. I'm sure it's, you are not the only one that God wants to use this message to bless. So please, everybody, go right now. But while I'm going to be reading the comments, let's go right now to the share button and share the message with our people. Some of you might have a telephone that you don't have, you don't see the, or you might have a computer where you don't see the share button immediately. Nah, but you can, you just have to go back to your page and press the share button. Just for a se second, you might stop listening to me for one second. Then you will continue listening to me after you press the share button. So let us all go out right now and sh press the share button, please. It's an appeal and it's an act of love for other people. Loving is sharing. Now, so he says, uh, who is the next person? Uh, Lorraine says wisdom. Ola says all human beings are valuable. God bless you, sir, and let this message be meaningful to all Nigerians. Nelly says, help our weakness, oh Lord. Yeah, for it to be meaningful to all Nigerians, Nigerians must listen to it. That's why I'm asking you to go share the message. Tega Amazi says, very rich the world and really good for the soul. Thank you. Kenneth says, thank you, sir, for God still defend those who have failed and are weak. Albert says, God bless you, Reverend. I'm enjoying the message, but I'm sorry I don't agree with the point that we are not of the, at the mercy of God. Uh, even though we have a personal person, no responsibility, we have human limitations. Yes, but <laughs> that is what I'm, that, I already explained that anyway, so you go listen to it again. Ephraim says, that is true talk. Lorraine says, one soul, one mind. Uh, oh, you will say, wow, this is great one. We are really blessed, not that we will be blessed. But we are blessed already. Yes, that's the point. That, that's what I mean, that we are not at the mercy of God. We just need to take charge, um, you know, take charge to, by re to being responsible and to believe God. That's why I'm saying we are not at the mercy of God in the sense that we don't need to wait for him to come and be, give us mercy right now. He already done that. He already given us that. So we are, believe, we are thanking him for it. We are believing him. We trust him that we already have it and we move forward. That's what I mean, that we are not at the mercy of God. Iabode says, Amen. Ronke says, I'm more in awe of God because of this teaching. Thank God. Valentino says, Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Jesus. Rose says, Amen, Amen. Anson David, the instructions he gave to me last year is to go do the work of the ministry. Yes. Go do it. Don't wait on God. That's as if God is, is the one stopping you. No, no. Go and begin to do something. Great Daniel says, Good morning, sir. Your teaching is a call for the restoration to fundamental kingdom values, which the modern church is lacking. May God help you to significantly impact the body of Christ. You are a blessing. Please, sir, a word of blessing. My marriage is 19 years today. I release that word of blessing upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. Then Mickey Ola says, God bless you, sir. Forsaking people whom are not adding to our lives, I forsake all and I become great. This is what the story of Abraham meant to me 20 years ago, and today I'm blessed. Thanks. Oyewa says, revelatory truth, sir, deep insight. Bismarck says, you said it all, pastor. Teju says, good morning. God bless you, sir. Glory Nena says, Nena says, God bless you, Pastor Sunday. God has used you to restore my hope for living. Thank God for that. Uh, <laughs> Louisa says, I will listen to the recorded message after my meeting with the African Union uh, Dean. We are celebrating the AU Day in Seoul, Korea. Please remember the African continent. I think this message should be a blessing to the African continent. So I want to challenge and ask all of you that are watching right now, please go and share this message with everybody on your list. Go right now and do it. Not at the end, because when you plan to do something at the end, you just get busy and you get distracted. Let's go and do it right now. Just go to your share button, to your page, and press the share button, please, everyone. Let's do that to help other people. 
Debra say, God bless you, sir. Comfort say, Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Taiwo says, God bless and increase you, man of God. Atta says, man, thanks for following it up by your write-up. McDonald said, God bless you. Uh, the man, Louisa says, we should at the Bible, and we should see the Bible as a book of principles. Life is a journey. The leading of the voice of God. Forsake things holding you down. Yes, yeah, those are the principles I pointed out today. Teresa says, God bless you. Ronke says, you are rearranging my thinking, sir. <laughs> Teresa says, I'm inspired by your word, man of God. God bless. Uh, Atta says, thanks for this great word, Pastor. Apostle says, yes, sir. Suleiman says, amen. Um, Mayam Louisa says, I meant, wow, powerful message. Oyewo says, you are a blessing. Hi, Pastor Sunday, a winner's pastor was asking me for one of your books, Money Won't Make You Rich. This book has really blessed me a lot. Money Won't Make You Rich will be on Amazon. So anybody that needs it could go on Amazon or in any book, Christian bookstore, actually. Okay, who else is there? Who did we leave out? Uh, Yvette says, invite friends also with button on the left. Oh, okay. He said, uh, Yvette is saying, you can invite friends to watch this message as well, not just to, uh, to share it. Share the message and invite people to watch it. Uh, then we have, who do we have there? Mummy, mummies. Mommy says, Pastor Adelaja, you make a lot of sense. He is the almighty God, Jehovah Barah. He is the God of possibilities. He has blessed us already. We are blessed. It is well with you, dear. Thank you, my sister. Carolina says, right on, Pastor Adelaja. God bless. Thank you. German Roche says, okay. Alabi Abali says, well, I miss the message. Judging by the comments, it's powerful. Right. You, you, you miss it, but you know you can still listen to the recorded message. Uh, ben says, God bless you, sir. Comfort says, Ekundayo, this message is not for Nigeria alone, but for all the body of Christ. God bless you, Pastor. Yvette says, good morning, Pastor Sunday. Yeah, it's Yvette from Holland. Wow, long time, my sister. People are leaving the churches because of religion. There is no power in religion. Last Sunday, I heard in a church that Okay, I heard in a church that people do not need to pray or fight or take and take authority. Just believe that God did everything already. Only worship him. He violated the book of James. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Put on the whole armor of God. Uh, pray in spirit on all occasions. So the preacher left the church powerless and in passiveness. Open for everything attack of the enemy. Thank you for this message, Pastor. If Yvette, long time. How a blessings to you and your family. Samuel says, great teaching, Pastor. I am dealing with an issue in my church at the moment, and this has enlightened me to be able to deal with it God's way. Thanks a lot. Uh, Weavers, Maureen Weaver says, Psalms 147.11, the Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that open his mercy. Yes. And that means that we should believe it, not just hope. And hope in this sense does not mean wait and just hope that it will come. No, no. Uh, hope, that, that means depend on it, trust in it. We know, we believe in his mercy. We trust in his mercy. That's what it means. Taku culture says, why did Jesus turn water to wine, sir? Jesus turned water to wine to teach us a lesson. First of all, the lesson there, the principle we should learn there is the mother of Jesus. When you don't have something, when you are in need and you are so desperate there is always somebody that has an answer in your vicinity around you you are only three or four telephone calls from your answer so jesus jesus's mother mary was in a desperate situation and all the people there was were in a desperate situation so that's a principle right there no matter the desperation of your situation if you look enough you will know that your answer is not just with god in heaven God has given an answer in somebody around you. So the mother of Jesus found someone around him. He found Jesus. That's an answer for us. So anytime I'm in any situation, the principle is that somebody has an answer. Go humble yourself. 
and even if you, sometimes you might need to you might be humiliated a little bit because it, jesus did not immediately do what the mother was asking him to, asking him to do but she had to humble herself and when you humble yourself that way you will always get an answer the other principles there is that even when you are at a at a crossroad like the the wine finished and it was like it was hopeless nothing could be done god always has an answer for you never give up hope so if you will have your faith in god and keep on pursuing the answer you will get an answer that those are some of the principles you will, you you can we can learn from that story uh it's not that he wants to teach us to drink uh Owoye says thanks for the answer i'm blessed Okay, Opong say religion is dead, but believers are resurrecting it again. <laughs> Shegun says, bless you, sir. Vina Shuku said, why did Jesus turn water? Okay, I already answered that. Jonathan Akoji, thank you, pastor. We have God's mercy. We just need to believe. <laughs> Aronke says, my name is mentioned. So Aronke is excited that his name, uh, her name is mentioned. Uh, Adebayo says, my beloved mentor, this is kingdom driven life and with this message sir church must shift in all continents throughout my years as a christian i have never been taught kingdom principle until i met you we are blessed to have you sir thank you thank you so much okay valentino said he has already shared uh, she has already shared the message so i want to challenge and call on everyone else to go ahead and share the message let's go ahead and share this message with our friends and also invite friends to these messages uh, great Daniel says, wow, amazing, great insight. Thank you. Olukayo, they said, shared. He has already shared the message as well. And I want all of you to share the message too. Uh, Mashu said, this is insightful. Temitokwe says, the rascalism in the body of Christ is not strong. We live as if we don't have the power of God. Yet, if only we know who we carry on the inside of us and go out in the understanding to preach and teach all nations, then the kingdom of God will come quickly. That is so true. Andrew says, I receive mercy. OB said, what of, what of if you are still in doubt? <laughs> if you are still in doubt, just believe. <laughs> it's your choice to believe or to doubt. Vina said, turns water to wine, please. What are the principles? I already answered that now. Emmanuel Apiafi Ap Ap says, Amen. New creation reality. We are his children. We already have his mercy. Thank you, sir. Glory to Jesus. Comfort says, the teaching in the church for a very long time is to keep people in the same place. People need to hear this, pastor. Well, for people to hear you, we need to share that with people. So I want you and to, to challenge and to ask all of you to go share this message with as many people as possible. Uh, Olukayo, they said, I wish I could jump in and hug you you have done great justice to this topic. <laughs> and maybe you could come here or look at your day sometime to Ukraine. If you wish to come, just write me to pastor at God Embassy. I will be willing to invite you and have you here as well. Uh, Shine Miriam says, an eye opener. Okay. What else do we see? With John Aderemi, Aderemi says, wonderful methodology of success. You are an inspiration. The Daniel of our generation who succeeded in a strange land. Thanks, Pastor Sunday, my brother. Thank you, Pastor John. Uh, then who do we have there? MC Biggie. Thank you, Pastor. You have blessed my life this morning. Thank you. Joseph said, inspiring and insightful. Keep the good work. Thank you. Obey says, I lay inspired by this great word. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Yevgenia Avramovich. Uh, that's, Shalom. that's in Russian. Um, Emmanuel Olushola, following the teaching this morning that God's word is basically principles based. Sir, what are the principles to engage in helping to renew my mind? Set of old members in a congregation that repels the new ones from setting, settling in a church. Oh, oh, that can you write me on that? Because I couldn't. That uh, that's a personal question. If you could write me, I will be able to give you some advice on that. Julio says, "Thank you, Pastor. The entrance of the word gives life and gives understanding to the simple. What your message says to me is that demonstration of it 
is very vital. Practicing the word is, is what brings results. Yes. Vivian says, pray for me, Pastor, and everyone going through hard times. This message has given me a better view about life, love from Los Angeles. Yes, in Jesus' name, if there's anybody going through hard time right now, we release the grace of God upon you that God will intervene and will, dis will destroy every obstacle, every work of the enemy, and you will move forward in faith in Jesus' name. Victor Ogundipo says, wow, wow, wow. Thank you, Pastor. I can't stop thinking about this truth or principles for living. Akin Pelu says, thank you, Pastor, for this great message. It's turned life around now. God's mercy is so sufficient for us all. What we need is just yield ourselves in his mercy. As Shioma says, God bless you, sir. May God continue to empower you in the name of Jesus. Love from Dublin. Uh, well, Emmanuel Apiafi already read that, I think. Oni says, more anointing. Uh, Regal say, God bless you, Pastor. God won't leave you alone. Thank you. Uh, Omoro Dion says, wonderful message. The Bible says all things are yours already. Yes. Isaac says, I think our problem starts with the kind of teaching that we hear from when we got saved. Many of these things we are hearing from you were not properly taught. I think we need a refocus. I hope so. I think so. Douglas says, thanks a million, Pastor, for making yourself available for God to use you in this season. How one watch the series? How can one watch the series, please? Uh, you can go to my YouTube blog. It's called Sunday Adelaja Official, and then see the series and watch everything. Or you can go to just my Facebook, this same place you are right now, and just go to the video department, and then you can watch all the videos there as well. Uh, Grace says, pure truth, sir. Sunday says, church shift shifted me to change my world. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Deborah said, Th Pastor, thanks you so much for enlightening the people of God. I know many will want to disagree with you. He that have ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. It's always a blessing listening to you. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. David Gulim says, Amen. Inv uh, Yvette says we should invite friends with a, but with a button on the left. Well, 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 well. And Yvette is saying, hope to see me and the church very soon again. Yes, I will be very happy to see you again, Yvette. Uh, success say thank you so much, sir, from your beloved son. Jeanette says, God bless you for all the work you are doing. Olu says, fresh fire from Jehovah daily on your life, sir. And some David says, I can already see you transforming Africa. Yes, yes, yes. Is going to happen in Jesus' name. And uh, well, thank you, everyone. And it's nice to be with you this morning. Bia said, God bless you for blessing me with this powerful word this morning. Thank you, everyone. Well, it was nice talking to you people today. Tonight, we are going to be observe, I mean, reviewing this message with, uh, I think, one of my children. And so I, I invite you to come to, on tonight at uh, 9.30 Ukraine time e evening. That's 7.30 uh, p.m. No, 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 not 9.30, 9 p.m. Ukraine time. That is 9 p.m. Ukraine time. That is 7 p.m. Nigerian time, 7 p.m. Uh, British time, 8 p.m. European time, and that will be uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. So God bless you all, and please don't forget to go share this message. Let's do it the very first thing we do right now. Go to your share button and share this message with your friends. Let it be a blessing to some other people. God bless you. Talk to you tonight, and tomorrow morning at 9.30, I'll be here again. Blessings. Bye.